Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. This series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and all of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. During the month of March, the NOAA Heritage Program is helping us take you behind the scenes at six different NOAA facilities during our NOAA Open House series. We are traveling virtually across the country to showcase some of the amazing places where our scientists, engineers, educators, technicians, and interns work. Today, we're visiting NOAA's Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Exploration Center in Santa Cruz, California. While we'll be taking you on a virtual tour of our Exploration Center, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that our speakers today are coming to us from the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can write questions. That's where you put your name and location in. Please let us know if you're a class tuning in. And if there are multiple people watching, let us know who's asking the questions so we can give them a shout out. We encourage you to ask those as we go and I will be keeping track for our speakers. They'll stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all your questions, but we're gonna to try to answer as many as we can. So now I'm gonna turn you over to my friend, Chelsea. Thanks, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you joined us today. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you our behind the scenes look at the Sanctuary Exploration Center, which is a visitor center for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary here in Santa Cruz, California, like Nicole said. Uh, before we get going on our tour, I wanted to make sure to introduce our tour guides. Like I said, my name is Chelsea and I'm pretty unique in that I'm actually from Santa Cruz. These two pictures are actually taken on pretty much the same beach right across the street from the Sanctuary Exploration Center. So I spent as a kid tons of time playing on the beach, playing in the sand, and that inspired me to want to pursue science as a career and then to want to share the information that I'd learned with people from all over the world, just like you guys. Hello, everybody. My name is Nick Ingram, and I'm excited to be with you here today. Um, on your screen is a picture of me as a youngster, and like Chelsea, I grew up uh, boating and fishing in the waters of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. All that time spent on the water eventually led me to a career in fisheries biology, which is the photo on the right side of your screen, where I spent some time working in Alaska studying halibut, um, but ultimately, I really like sharing my knowledge of the ocean with other people like yourselves. And so now I work for NOAA as an educator, specifically working for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Thanks for being here. Hello, everyone. My name is AC Wood, and I am currently a master's student at a local institution called the Moss Landing Marine Labs. And uh, I'm a little bit of a nomad. I was raised in Washington, started school in Hawaii, have gone up to Canada, down to Mexico, and now I'm here in California uh, and having a great time doing it. I grew up going to the ocean and visiting the Seattle Aquarium and instilled a passion for education and stewardship in me. And I am happy to share those skills with the Sanctuary Exploration Center. Great, thanks guys. We'll come back to you in a little bit when we share more. So to start things off today, I mentioned that Monterey Bay Sanctuary, I'm sorry, the Sanctuary Exploration Center is a visitor center for Monterey Bay Sanctuary. But you might not be aware that the National Marine Sanctuary Program actually has sites all over the United States. There's about 14 different sanctuaries and they're all set up to protect unique and special areas of the ocean or Great Lakes. So I know we have people logging in from all over the United States today. And it's possible that there's a sanctuary closer to where you live than you originally thought. 
We're gonna go ahead and zoom in to Monterey Bay, the central coast of California, and start here in Santa Cruz. You can see off to our left, there's a beach boardwalk. It's an amusement park that's really popular. We can kind of look down the, the run of the Santa Cruz Wharf, which goes about a half mile out into the sanctuary. And here we can see what a, a beautiful location we are. It's, this is Cowles Beach. You can see Westcliff Drive off in the background. And as we pan around, you're gonna be able to see across the street where the Sanctuary Exploration Center is located. So it's a really busy spot. There's a lot of tourists, a lot of activity, and we get to see a lot of people. If you look there across the street, you see that kind of blue glass building. That's the Exploration Center. We're gonna head across the street. Here we are. So before we go inside, I wanna share with you something that visitors don't normally get to see, which is that we are a LEED Gold building, which means we've made steps to be more environmentally conscious. So you can see we have solar panels on our roof. We have a seawater catchment base, I'm not sorry, not seawater, rainwater catchment basin called a cistern where we, that we use to water our native plant garden. And if you go inside the building, we have energy efficient lighting and even, yeah, it's gonna get there. Um, our toilets are all low flow so that we use as least amount of water as possible. So we wanna make steps to, and be an example of how um, other businesses or how people can be more environmentally conscious where they are. So here we are inside the Exploration Center. We're gonna head upstairs to start our tour and we're gonna go past some exhibits that we'll come by and check out later. So you're gonna get a sneak peek of our deep sea exhibit now. Nick's gonna share more on that in a bit. And then you're gonna get a sneak peek of our open ocean mural, which we'll come back and explore. But we're gonna start here at our introduction map. And normally, here we go. Normally, if you were to visit the Exploration Center, this is where you would start. You'd come up the stairs, be greeted by a docent or a staff member who would introduce you to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We've used that term a couple times already now, but I wanna show you guys what it is. So we have here a map of the central coast of California. You can see San Francisco Bay up here at the top. Here we are in Santa Cruz, and this is all Monterey Bay. Now, if you look at this red line in the ocean, that's the boundary for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It goes from just north of San Francisco Bay all the way down just south of Big Sur in Cambria. Everything within this red line is protected so that all the amazing ecosystems and habitats are protected from certain uses. And this exploration center helps share with people what makes this such a special place. So we're gonna go back. So we're gonna start today checking out, well, hold on, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna treat you today like you were normal visitors to the Sanctuary Exploration Center. So we're gonna check out four different exhibit spaces. First, I'm gonna share a bit about leatherback sea turtles. Then AC is gonna give us a tour of our kelp forest exhibit. Then Nick is gonna check, help us check out our deep sea exhibit, super fun. And finally, I'll round it out with um, our soundscape exhibit. So now you have an idea about where we're headed today. All right, we're gonna start with leatherback sea turtles though. So if you were to go right back down the stairs to the landing, you would be able to see our open ocean mural that's on the wall. And this is a cast of a real leatherback sea turtle that we actually have hung on the wall. Now leatherback sea turtles come to Monterey Bay, usually in the summer months specifically to eat, and I bet you can guess from this mural, jellies. Leatherback sea turtles love to eat jellies. Any guesses out there how many jellies a leatherback sea turtle has to eat every day in order to survive? I'm gonna pause right here with this beautiful shot. And Nicole, maybe you can help if anybody has entered into that chat. How many jellies do you think a leatherback sea turtle needs to eat every day? You can imagine right. they're mostly made of water. <laughs> All right, this is Nicole from the chat box. We are getting a lot of guesses. Hannah says 200. Uh, Sean says 100. Bryce says 23, which is very specific, Bryce. Thank you for that. Um, Eileen says 100. Uh, Let's see, Elijah thinks it's a thousand. Um, well, we're getting, we've got everything from a single jellyfish to 2000. So Jet, Jet says so 150. Bryce, Bryce is pretty close. 
It's about 50. Of course, it depends on the size of the turtle. It also depends on the size of the jelly, but around 50 jellies is what they need to eat every day. So you could imagine if you were a leatherback sea turtle, you just swim around all day like this guy looking for jellies to munch on. Here's one that actually had a camera strapped to him and he got the jelly. Good job. All right, so now back at the exhibit, if you're thinking to yourself, this is a huge sea turtle, you're totally right. Leatherback sea turtles are the largest sea turtles in the world and can get to be about 2,000 pounds. In fact, this one is actually a subadult, which means that it can get even bigger. As we pan around, you're gonna get a view of one of our art installations at the Exploration Center. This one, yep, here it comes into view, uh, was curated by local artists called the Jelly Ladies. And if you look closely, you can tell that it's actually made out of repurposed plastics. So things like holiday saran wrap or plastic bags. And as we look here, you can see that plastic does look quite a bit like jellies. And it turns out that in the ocean, plastic bags look like jellies to sea turtles too, and they end up eating them and it makes them sick. So we can all do our part to help protect sea turtles by making sure plastics stay off the streets and out of the oceans. All right, as we pan around here, you're gonna see that the Exploration Center doesn't have any live animals. We're not an aquarium. Instead, we have hands-on interactive games and activities to share all this information with our visitors. And we're gonna start with our leatherback exhibit. And if you were here with me normally, you'd be playing this game, but I'm gonna play it for you today. And so we are this leatherback turtle and I can control it and try to eat as many jellies as possible, right? I have to get to my 50 a day. And of course, I wanna to try to also not eat plastic bags. Oh, I got one, poor turtle. But let's see, as soon as I fill up on jellies, which I think we're gonna do in a minute, yay. Now I can start my migration. Leatherback sea turtles actually have their nesting beaches in Indonesia. That's about 7,000 miles away, all the way across the Pacific Ocean. And on that migration, they hit some challenges. Sometimes they can get struck by ships, which is certainly sad. Other challenges you might be able to see in the future, they might hit a shark. Oh no, did he get it? Oh, so close. He almost got by that shark. Of course, sharks are a predator, but because this is such a big migration and there are lots of challenges, leatherback sea turtles are actually a critically endangered species. But this guy got to his nesting beach, or her nesting beach, I should say, laid eggs and was able to replenish the population. Now, scientists are really concerned about leatherback turtles because they are endangered. And so here in Monterey Bay, we have scientists who study them. So this is a team of researchers that have caught this leatherback safely. They've put a satellite transmitter on its back so that they can monitor everywhere this sea turtle goes. And when it's swimming along, during its migration, we, we can track where it goes. So this one we mentioned was tagged in Monterey Bay. Here it goes across the Pacific. It's starting its migration all the way to Indonesia. And like I said, it's about 7,000 miles. But I'd like to take another question from you all. How long do you think it takes a leatherback sea turtle to migrate 7,000 miles? So that's just one way from Monterey Bay to Indonesia. Who wants to guess? Let's see, uh, Jamika says a year, um, Brianna says seven months. Um, let's see, is that Reed says 21 days, that seems fast. Um, oh, there, there's so many guesses. Um, let's see, 13 hours, says someone in Mrs. Cord's class. What about eight months, says Wyatt. Um, and Megan says it's nine months. So okay. are any of them? on track? Yeah, so Megan and Wyatt, you guys are definitely on track. So it takes about nine months, depends on how big it is and how tired it gets. But think about it, nine months, that's the entire time that you're in school. Say the whole time you're in fourth grade, this leatherback is swimming just one way. Then it has its, it nests on its beaches, lays its eggs, and ends up turning around and coming back, taking another nine months to a year. So it, it's a long way to go to eat jellyfish, but that's what they do. Let's see if he makes it. Yeah. So like I said, these leatherbacks are critically endangered. Scientists are studying to understand as much as they can so that we can better protect them. 
But one cool thing that has happened is recently um, leatherbacks became California state marine reptile, which will hopefully make it so that more people can learn about them and more people will understand what cool animals they are and worth protecting. Um, so with that, we're gonna let this video finish out and I'm, I'm Nicole ready to answer any questions anybody has about leatherbacks or the Exploration Center in general. Great. Well, thanks, Chelsea. That was so fun. We, we have a really great question from Kaylee. She would like to know, why do they want to get to Indonesia? Wouldn't it be easier to lay their eggs in Monterey? Oh, that's such a good question. And that takes a long answer. But basically, they, they go back to Indonesia because that's where they were born. So and um, leatherbacks that are born in Indonesia, they're little baby leatherbacks. They swim to the ocean. And then depending on the currents and the temperature and what's happening in the ocean, they either go straight across to Monterey Bay or they have actually other migration routes as well that they might go to go find food. But all the ones that end up coming to California, when they're ready to go back to their nesting beaches, they go back to the same beach. So the answer is because that's, that's where they were born. So it's just, they chose like the long way to go to find jellies. <laughs> So to clarify, because I think I saw that Eloise in Barbados said that they get leatherbacks there. So these are your leatherbacks in Monterey that go to Indonesia, but not all the leatherbacks go to Indonesia. Yes, good clarification. There are other um, nesting beaches like in Barbados, like you said, in Costa Rica, and they also migrate, but they migrate to other feeding grounds. So the ones that we have in the central coast of California came from Indonesia, which is the largest migration of any leatherbacks on earth but it's not the only one, yeah. Great, so in answer to your question then, Texas, there are leatherbacks in the Atlantic Ocean, just so you know that. Um, let's see, another great question I got was, Dorothy would want to know, do they swim all at one time or do they take breaks somewhere? Do they swim straight through? Good question, and you know, I know that that's something that scientists are still looking at. I'm pretty sure that when they come from Indonesia to California, they pretty much go straight through. But when they're heading back to their nesting beaches, they kind of do this thing where they do this big loop around the Pacific Ocean and maybe don't go all the way to Indonesia. And scientists don't know exactly why that is. Maybe they're mating along the way. Maybe there's a lot of food and they're not ready to go back to nest, but um, they seem to take longer to go back to their nesting beaches. All right, a couple more quick questions I wanna sneak in. Dorothy wants to know how big can a leatherback turtle grow to be? They can get to be about 2,000 pounds, which is about the size of a small car. So the one on the wall, you guys don't have a sense of scale, but it's about six feet long and they can get even bigger. It's maybe seven, eight feet long, really about the size of a small car. Um, and Alice and Paul wanna know how old are they when they start to migrate? Did you mention that? That is such a good, that's a really good question. And that's one that I, I actually don't know. I don't know if they wait till they're full grown until they migrate across. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, sorry about that. We'll see if somebody knows. Sometimes we find the answer by the end of the webinar. Um, do, and Emily in Mrs. Morales class would like to know, did they eat anything other than jellyfish? They eat mostly jellies and other kinds of kind of gelatinous, creatures, they're not super fast. And so they can't really chase down fast, fast fish or anything like that. But I'm sure if there were other small fish maybe mixed up with the jellies, they might eat those too. But they, they mostly go for slow moving gelatinous creatures, yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. I'm gonna save some of these so we make sure we have enough time for everybody, but I'll try to get to a few other ones um, at the end. I do wanna give a shout out to Mrs. Cord's fourth grade class at Grant Elementary in Santa Monica, and also Jennifer from Florida, one of our teacher at sea, NOAA teacher at sea alums is on the webinar and I wanted to give a shout out to her. So um, let's keep moving on our tour. Great, I just had a little bit of a glitch with my computer. I'm not sure why, but we will get this back. So next up, I'm going to introduce AC, who's going to give us a tour through kelp forests. And this, man, AC, just a second, if you can come on, I'm going to have to. No worries. Thank you. In the meantime, hello, my friends. I'm super excited to be here. And in just one second, we're going to start up this video so I can show you some really amazing things. And so Chelsea, when you're ready, feel free. 
Go ahead. All right. So now that we've learned about the amazing leatherback sea turtle, we're going to pass by our wonderful theater where we show our feature film, One Breath, on loop to our guests. It showcases the history of Monterey Bay and highlights a fascinating ecosystem found within Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And those are kelp forests, some of my favorite things in the world. So before I get started, I want you to imagine yourself driving down the beautiful Californian coast. As you travel, the road bends and curves along the Pacific Ocean. You pull over to one of the many vistas to take in the world famous views and notice groups of round objects swaying at the surface, rocking as the waves surge to the shore. Birds are flying overhead, and if you're lucky, you might see a sea lion or sea otter's head pop up from the fronds. You have discovered a kelp forest. Chances are those brown objects were giant kelp. These behemoth algae can grow taller than most trees and can support vast ecosystems that help make California as diverse and gorgeous as it is. But what is a kelp? What is algae? <laughs> most Californians have experienced algae in some way. Maybe you've picked up seaweed that washed up on a beach, or you found rocks covered with algae when you went tide pooling. While most algae don't grow larger than a few feet, giant kelp tower over the seabed, just like trees in a forest. These special algae create dynamic ecosystems that can be broken into separate layers, just like how a land forest can be. The first layer is the benthic zone. This is the bottom of the sea. Down here, you may find a few fish like lingcod or cabazon or a rockfish like what's behind me. But you'll also find animals like sea urchins or sea cucumbers that lack facial features entirely. Despite looking so different, our benthic neighbors are still very much alive as they traverse around the bottom of the ocean. The second layer is the surface. The surface acts as the boundary between the air and the sea, making animals like seabirds and marine mammals a common sight here. This is also the easiest place for humans to explore. You can kayak out or paddleboard to the surface of a kelp forest easily enough. It's a lot of fun. In between the bottom and the surface is the midwater zone. Fish are a common sight here, um, and if you're lucky, you might see an occasional shark on the fringe. Marine mammals such as harbor seals are also a common sight as they search for food all throughout the forest. This layer is still somewhat easy for humans to interact with. You only have to either hold your breath to go down, but I do recommend that you have a mask and a snorkel if you want to see what you're doing. Let's go ahead and use our giant kelp here to go over the parts of the kelp. Starting at the bottom is the holdfast, which the kelp uses to just hold fast onto things. Although it may look similar to a root system on a plant, the holdfast primary role is to just secure a kelp to a point and keep it there. Attached to the holdfast is the stipe. These are the support structure of the kelp. The stipes of giant kelp can grow almost a foot a day within the sanctuary. It's really, really fast. Attached to that stipe are gas bladders called nematocysts. These gas-filled orbs can help keep the kelp aloft and allow it to reach the surface. Lastly, we have the blades, which are also attached to the stipe. These leaf-like structures allow it to gather up as much sunlight as possible so it can form photosynthesis, just like how plants on land do. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with kelp forests, let's take a virtual dive to explore them a little more. At the NOAA Sanctuary website, you can find numerous virtual dives that allow you to see what it's like scuba diving through various marine sanctuaries. If you click the Monterey tab, you can experience dives taken in the kelp forest. Down here, you can see the silhouettes of giant kelp and some California sea lions. We can tell that these are California sea lions and not seals thanks to their large wing-like flippers that they use to swim around the kelp forests. Using the mouse, we can click and drag, look around all 360 degrees and up and down. And I highly encourage you to explore to your heart's content. It's a lot of fun. Down here in the benthic layer, we can also see a lot of animals that look very different from ourselves. Going to a different dive, we can see the water is a little clearer this day. As we navigate around, we can see different fish and many organisms that live between the rocks at the bottom of the sea. Many of the rocks down here have organisms like sponges and crust coral growing out of them, providing a home for other animals like snails. That large pyramid-like structure on top of that rock is actually the holdfast of a giant kelp, which can contain an entire ecosystem in itself. All kinds of non-kelp algae can be found down here as well, such as red, green, and brown kelp, all growing amongst each other like a garden. Feel free to use these resources to learn all about kelp forests and explore the sanctuary from the comfort of home. Up next, we're gonna have some time for some questions and then we'll take a dive into the deep sea. That's great, AC. This is Nicole from the chat box. Hey, I, this seems like such a cool exhibit. Um, and so when you're in the exhibit hall, 
Are you standing under kelp at any point? Yes. Yeah, you're standing or standing underneath our um, our mock-ups of giant kelp, and uh, since they are just that giant kelp, they can get actually over 100 feet long. We don't have life-sized versions. Uh, our sanctuary commonly has 30 to 40 feet long kelp, giant kelp, while our, our mock-ups are maybe about 20 feet. So uh, you, it does feel like you're walking through a kelp forest, but I like to highlight that they get way bigger than what we see. Got it. All right. Well, um, I have to make a minor correction. I, I mispronounced someone's name. So it's Mrs. Cordez, I think, in Grant Elementary in Santa Monica. So I apologize for that. I also want to give a shout out to the Mass Marine Bio class from Sandy Hook, New Jersey, and Landmark Middle School is really representing today. So a few questions that I have. Um, let's see. Uh, the first is, um, sorry, they're coming in. I got to scroll back up. Um, what's the range of, of kelp? Is it found on both coasts? William would like to know. We mostly find kelp on this coast. Um, and there's actually a really cool thing that people are studying right now called the kelp highway and how um, kelp has theoretically migrated over uh, when the land bridge forms between or was existing between Russia and what is now North America. And kelp um, migrated over, bringing with it populations such as sea otters and fish that live within kelp forests and allow these ecosystems to sneak down the West Coast. So you can find kelp all over the world for sure. Um, but mostly I, we focus on kelp that are here on the West Coast. I hope that answers your question. Well, from another person, uh, actually a local in Santa Cruz, John wants to know, why do I see lots of kelp washed up on shore at various times during the year? That is a great question. It highlights one of the amazing things about giant kelp. Uh, they are annuals. They are only here for less than a year. An adult is going to hit that adult size, which again can be over 100 feet uh, long, in less than a year. And then during the strong winter months, which we're just now kind of coming to an end to, a lot of energy surges through the ocean and can rip up that entire forest and throw it onto the shore, which is fine. They've already released everything they need to to seed the next generation of forests, which will grow up again in the summer and spring to that titanic massive height. Great question. Great. Um, let's see. Maria and Rachel both want to know if kelp are plants. <laughs> okay. are plants? Great question. Um, and so the way that I like to describe this is that uh, oftentimes people ask if um, Algae are plants, kelps are algae. Um, however, I like to say that plants are like land algae. Plants all uh, fanned out on the evolutionary tree from a small branch of uh, algae, believe it or not. So while they are analogous, um, I would like to say that seaweeds did it first. <laughs> so uh, we don't call them plants uh, in the scientific realm. It's convenient to use the term plants because they do look like them and people get that idea across, but they are not true plants in the sense that uh, other things are. Yes, well, that was a good question then. Um, even I didn't, I thought I knew the answer and it turns out I was wrong. Um, so uh, we are, first of all, those the otter that you showed, everyone was very excited about the otters. Are there, uh, I'm getting some questions about whether dolphins can um, navigate the kelp forest and um, how many other animals thrive. I mean, I remember last year we learned about giant sea bass um, from Ryan in the Channel Islands. Um, so what are some other um, animals that thrive there? Sure, uh, I'm gonna deconstruct that a little bit. So larger organisms like dolphins or sharks or whatnot, they don't really like to explore too deep into the kelp forest and for giant kelp at least. And one of the reasons for that is if you see in my video or actually the video that Chelsea has here, our mock-up giant kelp, they only have that single one stipe that are going up. But a real giant kelp can have dozens, sometimes up to a hundred stipes coming from a single hold fast. And even when you're scuba diving, it is ridiculously easy to get tangled up and stuck inside that giant kelp. So if you're too large and have a lot of things that can get caught like fins, it can be really hard to navigate um, at a fast speed, which uh, larger predators like dolphins and sharks rely on to catch prey. Our sea otters and sea lions and whatnot, they're pretty agile and able to make their way through. But overall, uh, we don't see a lot of large things, uh, well, larger things, um, you do occasionally. Uh, my friends just saw a couple of great whites in the kelp forest a couple of weeks ago. That was a that was a cool moment. But uh, I could spend an entire 
multi hour long lecture on just the animals you can find. So I'm going to broad it out here. Fish, anemones, urchins, marine mammals, birds, humans, um, all sorts, snails, uh, all sorts of things. It's a, it truly is a forest. There's a lot going on. All right, I'm going to give you one more question. That was a great answer, by the way. One more question is, um, what eats kelp? And can we, do we eat kelp? I like this question a lot because I am an advocate for marine harvesting when it's done in a sustainable manner. And uh, fun fact, all marine algae are edible, totally fine. Some taste better than others, but no marine algae is going to harm you. Freshwater algae will, do not consume that, uh, but all marine algae is safe for human consumption. Uh, so there, just uh, along the California coast, uh, you can go down and get uh, the seaweed that's used to make sushi. Uh, nori, that's totally easy. Sea lettuce, totally easy. Uh, there's a lot of seaweeds that are edible. So you can actually eat um, giant kelp if you want to. And some of the, our little buddies that really like eating giant kelp are sea urchins, which uh, is a huge topic nowadays. Uh, and I think we're, we may explore that a little bit more, <laughs> but a lot of things like to eat kelp. Great. Well, for those who are interested, we are going to have a seaweed aquaculture webinar coming up on April 7th. So we might be talking more about that then. All right, AC, I'm going to let you turn it over to Nick and I'm going to um, silence and hope for some more questions. Good job, guys. All right, Chelsea. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. And I want to take you into the deep sea of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Now, we saw that beautiful kelp forest with those scuba divers, but most of the sanctuary is actually too deep to study by scuba diving. And in some places, like the Davidson Seamount, which is offshore from our sanctuary, it's 13,000 feet deep. That's over two miles deep, and the water down there is pitch black. But we still find life, like amazing fishes, deep sea octopus, and even weird creatures like this sea spider. <laughs> This is also the home to deep sea corals, which are really cool because unlike their shallow water cousins that make those beautiful coral reefs, these corals are living in complete darkness and freezing water temperatures, near freezing water temperatures, yet they can still be 10 feet tall and 200 years old. These are difficult habitats to visit. So at the Exploration Center, we've built a model of the deep sea. And this is actually a tank, there's no live animals, but it's about 15,000 gallons and it's built to look like the deep sea habitats of Monterey Bay Sanctuary. This tank also comes equipped with its own remotely operated vehicle system or ROV. You can think of an ROV sort of like an underwater drone that scientists send down to the bottom of the seafloor to help us research an area that's too difficult or dangerous for humans to go to. This ROV is pretty simple and has a camera and the thing that's different about a drone and an ROV is that ROVs that are in the water have to be controlled with a tether. And we can see that here is that sort of yellow cord. And we currently can't use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to communicate through water over those depths. So we use this cable to connect it to our control system. I'll mention at this point that technology is super important for how we do research in the deep sea. And although this ROV is pretty simple and doesn't have a lot of tools, it takes a lot of time and effort to keep it operational. And part of my job here at the Exploration Center, I actually built that ROV and it's my job to keep it running. Um, along with that, I also manage all the AV equipment that keeps our other exhibits running. And I'll just take this time to mention that even though you might not be interested in biology or octopus or fish, you can still work in the deep sea environment by being an expert in the technology field. So keep that in mind. Let's head back to our ROV though, and let's go ahead and deploy it into the tank. And we're gonna take a look and see if we can find some stuff here in our deep sea tank. So we're gonna peer over the side here. We can see we have our ROV deployed. It's down in the tank. And remember, our tank's only about 15 feet deep. But if we were using an ROV to explore the canyon, our ROV might be two miles down and well out of sight. So we have to use our camera and our screen to see what we found. At the center, we have some signage you can use to help you figure out what it is you found. And it looks like what we just found was a yellow sponge here. It's a deep sea sponge. But I'm going to give you guys a chance to see if you can identify some animals. So we can actually pause this video here 
And Nicole, let's see if people have any guesses about what we're looking at here in our tank. Okay, this is Nicole from the chat box. So what does that look like that we've frozen our frame on? So Texas says it's the tumbleweed anemone. And um, I have to say, everyone seems to agree with him. <laughs> well, you guys are experts. Yeah, that's definitely a tumbleweed anemone. Let's take a look around a little bit more and see if we can identify any others. And so usually, right, we'd be looking just at our, our TV monitor and we'd have to sort of determine what we're looking at. What do you guys think we see here? All right, so Sarah says spider crab. And uh, let's see, everyone, Allison says a rockfish on the other one. And, and some people are furiously typing in both. So thanks, May, I got it. <laughs> awesome, yeah, you guys are, are pretty good at this. And let's take a look at one more. There's our yellow sponge again. So let, let's take a look at this guy. This is everyone's favorite. What's this one? Oh yeah, let's see. I just saw Bryn even just noticed a flapjack octopus is really cute. <laughs> local celebrity. That's right. Well, great job everybody. Yeah, and so this is how scientists do research in the deep sea. And it's a really cool way for us to get a lot of amazing images from a place we would never be able to visit. Also out in the deep water habitats of our sanctuary are amazing ecosystems like this one. This is called a whale fall. And whale falls are really well studied here in the sanctuary because we have so many deep water habitats. It's easy for us to use those ROVs to study them. And basically it's just that. It's a dead whale that sank to the seafloor and provides home and food for deep sea animals. At the center, we have some other artifacts you can check out from the deep sea, uh, like a piece of Davidson Seamount. This is actually a, a piece of um, deep sea coral that you can take a close look at. And we have other digital games, kind of like our Turtle One, only this one lets us explore a whale fall. And so using the arrows, we can sort of scan around this imaginary whale fall and discover some of the amazing critters that call it home. Like these Ocidax worms are bone eating worms that live in the deep sea and they can eat an entire whale skeleton over the course of several years. Pretty cool stuff. And they were discovered right here in Monterey Bay. So with that uh, amazing factoid, we'll hand it over for some questions. That is great. Thanks, Nick. Um, <clears throat> just after that whale fall, um, someone wanted to know what kind of octopus that was. So T and Mary are asking, there were lots of little octopus all over that. Was it, that a different kind? So those are not our flapjack octopus. Uh, I don't know that they have a, a accepted common name in the scientific community. We often use um, the, the Latin names or the genus name. And I believe the genus for those octopus is moose octopus is how it's pronounced. And um, they were discovered in large numbers recently near the Davidson Seamount. And um, you guys might actually see some of that stuff um, in other channels that you learn about the ocean. But yeah, moose octopus is the, the genus name for those particular ones that we saw there. Great. Um, so Claire, uh, I think this is Mrs. NG's class. Um, they had asked, and I think you, we could kind of see it in the whale fall there, but how are you able to get camera footage of the sea in pitch black darkness? Ah, yes. Yeah, so our ROV that we have at the center I mentioned is pretty simple and it only goes to a depth of about 15 feet, right? Because our tank's not that big. And at that depth, there's plenty of natural light that can get down into the water. But like you guys so astutely pointed out, at the bottom of the ocean, it's very dark. And so the larger, more complex ROVs that scientists are using to do research in the sanctuary have really, really bright lights on them to help illuminate that dark ocean down there. They also have a lot of other tools that our ROV doesn't have, like maybe like little grabber arms so they can take samples um, and a number of other tools and equipment. Got it. You also introduced a term, Nick, at the very beginning. Um, you mentioned a seamount. Can mm. you explain what a seamount is? Of course, yes. A seamount is basically an underwater mountain uh, so kind of like a hump that comes up off the seafloor, but it has to come up greater than 
1,000 meters from the surrounding seafloor. So that's about 3,000 feet. It's a mountain that's taller than 3,000 feet, but it can't break the surface. So as soon as that mountain comes up, and if it broke the surface, then we call it an island, right? So it's essentially um, a mountain that's on the bottom of the seafloor that's greater than a thousand meters from the surrounding seafloor. That's that's a sorry, that's not a very good description, <laughs> but hope, hopefully a, you guys get it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, and I just got to I got to relay this question from Barney, another teacher at Sea alum from the state of Washington. When you were talking about those bright lights, um, do they affect the life that's used to being in the dark? So are we hurting any of those animals on the bottom of the sea with those lights? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, I can't speak definitively for um, if it's doing harm to the animals, but it's a good point to bring up that um, ROVs, although they allow us to do research in the deep sea and explore things we wouldn't be able to any other way, they have their limitations, right? They have these bright lights and these loud motors and hydraulic arms. And you guys can imagine that if you were at home eating dinner at your table and a really big robot with bright lights making a ton of noise peered into your window, you might not be acting the way you normally would at dinner time, right? You might run away or you might hide under your table or you might go take a closer look depending on who you are. So it's important to remember that ROVs could be altering the behavior or even possibly scaring away some of the things. So we can't rely on them to learn about everything in the deep sea, but it's certainly a good start. So I'll, I'll take over from here. Thanks, Nick, for talking about the deep sea. Yeah, we have one more ecosystem we want to talk about when we're exhibit at the Exploration Center. And that's like I mentioned, our, our soundscapes exhibit. So this video, of course, is going to take a second and we're actually going to be listening. So part of the big part of this exhibit is listening to the sounds of the sanctuary. So it's, we have to launch the video a little differently. All right, thanks so much, Grace, it's working. Great, so moving on from our deep sea exhibit, you guys, we're gonna come around to our soundscapes exhibit. Of course, your first question is probably, what the heck's a soundscape? Well, it's all the different noises that might occur underwater. So things like from animals, or from people like ships, or even from the earth, like from earthquakes or landslides. And scientists are studying the sounds that occur in the sanctuary so that we can really understand how they're used and how they're important for animals. And in Monterey Bay, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has a underwater observatory that we're gonna zoom into. That's basically like an underwater power box. So scientists can go down and plug in their equipment and it'll work. And so one of the things that is always plugged in down there is this hydrophone. So it's basically an underwater microphone that's listening to the sounds in Monterey Bay all the time. And um, we have taken some of those sounds and turned them into an exhibit. So we are going to select one of these icons. We don't know which one it's gonna play. And the way these videos work is first, you're gonna just hear the sound. You might need to turn your volume up now. And you can also see the spectrogram at the bottom, which is how scientists actually visualize sound. So let's listen in and see here. Male humpback whales Male vocalize humpback in whales complex vocal. rhythmic arrangements called songs that can last more than 30 minutes. All right, so we have humpbacks in Monterey Bay close to year round and they're very vocal. They communicate with each other a lot. Especially, I love that the males sing songs to attract females. I think that's awesome. I'd love if a whale sang a song to me, um, but let, let's, let's look at another example now. Orcas use calls and whistles to communicate with each other, and, like dolphins, they use echolocation to hunt prey. So you might have thought those orcas sound a lot like dolphins, and that's because they are a type of dolphin. And just like dolphins, they can also send out flicks 
to echolocate and try to find food that they might not be able to see with their eyes. So we're gonna listen to another example of that. Like bats, sperm whales use echolocation to hunt for food. Their regular steady clicks bounce off objects to reveal prey in a dark ocean. All right, so you all heard that click, 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 and that's the animal sending out a sound beacon that then gets bounced off and comes back and makes a picture in their mind of, like I said, food that they might not be able to normally see. So it's a really important way for them to survive. We're going to listen to one more. Large ship traffic has increased in recent decades, amplifying background noise over a large area. These human-induced sounds can interfere with marine mammal communication. All right, so if you're an animal that relies on sound to either communicate with each other or to find food, you could imagine that if a big ship came overhead, it might make it harder for you to do that. I know from being a scuba diver that if I'm underwater and even a small boat comes over, it sounds so loud, it, it affects me. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we're studying the sounds of the sanctuary to understand how all of these things play together. Um, as we take our little stroll through back the, to the front of the exploration center and out to our front patio, we're gonna show you the awesome view that we get to enjoy every day. And I'll let you ants, um, type in any last minute questions you have for any of us into the, in the chat box and um, invite AC and Nick to come on to, to answer anything anybody has. Well, Chelsea, thank you so much. I, I have to say that looks like a pretty sweet office. Um, and while we're um, on the subject of that, do you um, want to tell, we've got a lot of people really wanting to visit now. I think you've um, successfully uh, <laughs> sold your location. So what is the status of the uh, Exploration Center right now? So, so we are currently closed. Um, although California is progressing into a, a better state of starting to reopen things, reopening some museums and visitor centers, um, we are going to be closed until it's safe to do so and until NOAA, our organization that oversees us, tells us that it's it's okay to reopen. So we currently don't have an exact reopening timeline, but we hope that, of course, later this year we will be. And so we'd love for people to come and visit. Um, we're free admission. I didn't mention that. We're open five days a week, free admission. So we would love for you all to come visit us. Including weekends. Including yeah. weekends. All right, sign me up. Okay, um, a question for AC. Harriet wants to know, um, do kelp just live close to the coast or are they in, out in the ocean as well? What a remarkable question, Harriet. I really like that you highlighted that. They are primary, or primarily coastal. And let's go ahead and explore that a little bit. Uh, like my friend Nick was highlighting during the deep sea, there's not a lot of light that makes its way down to the bottom of the ocean, if any at all. And because our algae perform photosynthesis, just like our land plants do, we need some sunlight to do anything. That's what's so remarkable about giant kelp and why they get their name giant kelp. Because compared to most other algae, they get huge. The, the term giant is not there just because. Uh, most seaweeds do not, a good size seaweed is maybe six or seven feet, and that's like a good size. So the fact that giant kelp, I think the record right now is 150 feet long. They can persist from that far down and make their way to the surface. It's mind blown. It would be like if someone was on earth and reached up to touch the moon. They are incredible. I'm sorry, I can rant about this for a while. To answer your question, we primarily see them around coastal ecosystems, not so much out in the open ocean. Thank you. I, love your, I love your enthusiasm for kelp, AC. Um, Nick, a question for you. Um, Sarah wants to know, can ROVs bring things back to the scientists? That is an excellent question, Sarah. And yes, some ROVs, in fact, most of the ones that researchers are using out in the canyon are equipped with um, sample baskets. So they basically have a little basket on board and a robotic arm that scientists can control from the surface to pick things up, whether it's a rock or a whale bone 
and they can put it in that basket and that way when the ROV comes back to the surface, they can take that sample home with them and learn more about it. Great. Well, I'm going to give you guys, uh, first of all, I want to let Jet know that all these, um, the videos and, and every this whole webinar is being recorded, so that will be up on our uh, NOAA Live website. So many of you had questions about dolphins and corals and sharks and uh, seaweed, and I urge you guys to explore our library and um, hear from other NOAA folks throughout the country that we've hosted before on a NOAA Live webinar, because um, some of your questions can be answered by a lot of different NOAA folks, and we won't be able to get to them today. Um, I wanted to ask each of you, so we'll start with Chelsea, what is your favorite part of your job? I have a pretty great job. I have a lot of favorites. Um, I love working with my coworkers. AC and Nick are fabulous and make it wonderful to come to work every day. And one of the things that makes it wonderful is that we all are really passionate about sharing this science and sharing this, everything about these ecosystems and animals with everybody. So when I'm working at the Exploration Center, I never know who's gonna come in the front door. We have people from all over the world. We've had celebrities. And we get to have conversations with them about what makes this place special. And that's that's pretty awesome. Cool. What about you, AC? Uh, yeah, I'd have to say uh, the fact that we get to see people from all over the world is amazing. And uh, I like learning languages and learning about other places. So it's fun to be able to practice uh, the little skills I pick up. Um, so that that's always fun. But I would say for me, we have... Uh, under normal operating conditions. We have a large force of volunteers who are the heart and absolute soul of the center. And I love being able to hang out with my volunteers and just uh, catch up and it's a great social aspect. And then a, a guest comes in, um, see them light up and be able to share the information that we've taught them and just see that pass around to the community and know that uh, that stewardship grows. Even if I leave, uh, that stays. And that's probably the most satisfying and favorite part of the job. Great. And Nick, what about you? Uh, I could go on and on about all the things I love about my job. But in addition to being uh, trained as a fisheries biologist and working in this education role for NOAA, as a hobby of mine, I also am very creative. I like to draw and create things. And part of my job at the Exploration Center is managing exhibits. And that also means getting to use some of my creativity and artistic talents to help communicate scientific topics like some of the stuff we talked to you today about through art and illustration. And that's really exciting to me to create these tools that um, folks like myself and AC and Chelsea get to use to help explain really complex topics um, and just sort of create those resources and have them be around um, even when I'm not around anymore. So I really like to sort of use my other talents to help spread the love for oceans and educate others. Well, thanks for that, Nick. You guys are collectively just a great example of the diversity of skill sets and just passion that um, exists at NOAA. And um, I can't wait to come to Santa Cruz. I'm going to have to put that on my uh, on my travel list for sure. I just want to um, thank you guys so much for taking us on a tour um, of, of the Exploration Center. And I also want to remind everybody that next week we are going to NOAA's Seafood Inspection Facility. Also in California, we're going to be in Long Beach. So pack your sunscreen. And then after that, we're headed to Kodiak on March 30th. And then uh, on March 31st, our last open house is going to be in Lakeland, Florida at the Aircraft Operations Center. So I hope you guys will mark your calendars and join us for that. And I hope you guys go back to your warm sunny California weather it was great great for, to have you today and um, I'm sure you've introduced folks to a lot of um, what's great about being in Santa Cruz I think you're going to get a lot of visitors when you reopen cool, cool. thanks thank everybody you so much, bye thank you so bye. much bye.